guys, welcome back to my channel. If you're already a subscriber, I really want to thank you again for your support. I hope you're enjoying my videos as much as I enjoy bringing them to you. If you're new to my channel though, I still want to express my appreciation for your stopping by, and I hope you'll consider subscribing too. I have lots of twisted true crime stories in the works. Today's video is another crazy one. In fact, it's definitely in the top three of cases that really shocked me. But before I set the scene, I need to insert a sensitive material disclaimer here. For real, this one nearly had me hyperventilating. Warning, the following video contains material that may be harmful or disturbing to some audiences. Viewer discretion is advised. Barbara Mackle loved Christmas, always. She enjoyed celebrating her favorite holiday with her family and little posse of girlfriends, and she adored the traditions, especially decorating the Christmas tree. Start at the bottom, she would whisper to herself as a little girl. Then she would work her way up, filling in the lush branches with treasured ornaments and keepsakes. But she was too small to place the beautiful angel on the top, even when she reached college age. That job, along with trimming the lights, belonged to her father. Robert F. Mackle saw to it every year that his family had a traditional Christmas tree, a blue spruce or some other pine tree. But the family could just as easily have decorated a pindo palm, since they lived in Coral Gables, Florida, a posh suburb of Miami. No white Christmases, but the holiday was Barbara's favorite time of year. Barbara was born to Robert and Jane Mackle, and in 1968, she was a 20-year-old student at Emory University, a private college in Atlanta. The Mackles were what we might deem flush. They had lots of money, even by Miami standards, and they had influence as well. Robert was a very powerful and successful real estate developer, and by the late 60s, he was worth millions, big time millions. Estimates cite his worth around $65 million. He even counted then-president-elect Richard Nixon and J. Edgar Hoover, the first director of the FBI, as personal friends. Now, during the winter semester of 1968, the Hong Kong flu ravaged the Emory campus, and Barbara became ill just before finals. Her mother Jane traveled from Florida to nurse her back to health and booked a little motel room at the Roadway Inn for them in Decatur, near the college. Barbara, despite her illness, was determined to meet her academic obligations and planned to complete her exams. That fortitude and determination was in her DNA, and she would be forced to call upon these attributes in the days to come. On December 17, 1968, Barbara and Jane were startled by a loud knock on their door around 4 a.m. Barbara was still running a fever, so she remained in bed, but her mother peered through the peephole and spied a police officer standing in the hallway. He informed her there had been an accident involving a white Ford automobile, believed to belong to Barbara's close friend, Stuart Woodward. As Jane unlatched the chain, two intruders, one unmasked male wearing the policeman's hat and another slight figure in a ski mask, burst into the room. In a meticulously conceived plot, the pair chloroformed Mrs. Mackle and tied her up before swiftly ushering Barbara at gunpoint from the room. Approximately 20 minutes later, the trio arrived in a dense wooded area. Then the unthinkable happened. The tall man ordered Barbara from the car and forced her to climb into a long wooden box that was buried about two feet down into a pre-dug trench in the woods. As expected, Barbara became hysterical, but threatened with the rifle pointed at her, she complied as ordered and crawled into the box. While primitive looking, the coffin-like structure actually boasted a capsule liner with a small battery-operated lamp, a wall-mounted fan air pump contraption, a jug of water with a long straw made of plastic tubing, and some wrapped candies. Before shutting the lid, the kidnappers snapped a photo of the terrified heiress holding a sign that read, Kidnapped. Oddly, she was smiling in the picture. She pleaded and screamed, but the evil pair sealed her into the box. Then they covered it with dirt, actually mud, and walked away, leaving nothing but Barbara's panicked pleas for help 
and a small plastic pipe jutting out of the ground. Okay, I need to breathe. I almost chose to not share this story due to its graphic themes and my own claustrophobia. I get anxious in a strip mall fitting room, so this story is a rough one. But moving on. Despite the chloroform, Jane was never unconscious and was able to call for help right away, but she could only describe the intruders as a tall man with the hat and a shorter man, very slight, with the build of maybe a teenage boy. Then it seemed everyone descended on the little motel, including Barbara's father, Robert, and her friend, Stuart. In short order, the influential Mackles were joined by several FBI agents dispatched by their old pal, J. Edgar, who was still acting director of the FBI. Leading the investigation was Agent Rex Schroeder. Since the kidnapping of aviator Charles Lindbergh's son in 1932, kidnapping was a federal crime, hence the involvement of the Federal Bureau of Investigation in the Mackle case. The Bureau, however, opted to not alert local authorities to the kidnapping, which would later prove to be a costly mistake. They waited to hear from the pair who had abducted Barbara, and they waited some more. They were all on high alert. Barbara had been missing for hours. Unsure whether this might be a hoax, they began investigating parties close to the family. They started with Stuart Woodward, Barbara's friend who drove a white Ford, as referenced by the phony policeman. Stuart had been the first person to arrive at the motel to comfort Barbara's frantic mother. Now this looked very suspicious to authorities. Who was this Stuart Woodward? Stuart Hunt Woodward was born in May 1947 in Charlottesville, Virginia. He was an Emory University student, a lover of animals, and a ham radio enthusiast since he was 10. He was also Barbara Mackle's closest confidant. Stuart felt the intense pressure of being the primary person of interest in the abduction. Despite Jane's assurances that he was like a member of the family, investigators interrogated him for hours. He knew a great deal about the Mackles. He was more than familiar with their money, stating that everybody knew about the wealthy family and their lucrative business dealings. He was the first to suggest that Barbara was likely kidnapped for a ransom. The interview continued, and Stewart answered investigators' prodding questions but he could not seem to make the agents understand that he and Barbara were just very close friends. She had dated others, he explained, but their relationship was just best friends, no benefits. Eventually, Stewart excused himself. He was not under arrest, so he planned to drive home to Virginia to be with his family. They let him go, but they put him under surveillance. Soon, though, they would hear from the kidnappers. A phone call came into the Mackle residence where agents had set up their command station. A strange voice with what sounded like a Latino accent ordered them to dig up a ransom note buried beneath a designated tree on the Mackle property. Ironically, the note was actually a scroll stuffed into a glass beaker which made for a capsule-like container similar to that which housed the terrified co-ed now buried alive. According to the kidnappers, she had at least a few days' worth of air. The hours were ticking away. Her captors demanded $500,000, about $3.6 million in today's economy. The note said they would be contacted soon with further instructions. Tired of playing defense, agents posted an ad in the classifieds pleading for their dear one to come home, along with the offer to pay any, quote, expenses, end quote. A second call came in, demanding that Robert bring the money to a causeway in a neighboring town. He was to dress in a white suit and come alone in his luxury car, which they would be able to identify. The money was gathered and the plan was underway. Robert delivered the attache filled with cash as directed. But before he could arrive back to his house to await news about his daughter's release, he learned the plan had been bungled. I mentioned that the FBI decided to not inform local authorities about the kidnapping. Big mistake. Two beat cops saw a suspicious-looking figure grabbing a briefcase from a remote bridge and pursued him. The kidnapper fled, dropping the bag containing the money. 
Officers chased and shot at him, but after sustaining an injury while jumping a fence, he slipped away into the dark night. By this point, Robert Mackle was sure his daughter was dead. He said as much to the agents who were desperately waiting for another contact from the kidnappers. They had all the money back from the drop. Now they just needed to wait to hear where to drop it. Meantime, Barbara was running out of time. She had long stopped screaming, opting instead to conserve her oxygen and control her breathing. She nibbled the candies left for her and sipped water through the long tube. She could not have known the liquid had been laced with sedatives to make her sleep. Finally, the call came to attempt a second ransom drop. Agent Schroeder this time informed all law enforcement officers of the plan. And this time, the money drop went off without a hitch. But it had been hours, and they still didn't have Barbara back. So while her family and the investigative team had begun to lose hope, Barbara was resigned to her fate and slid into a peaceful state of surprising calm. She had accidentally pulled the tube from the water jug, so there was no more water. The kidnappers hadn't checked on her again. How long had it been? It seemed like weeks. Months, maybe, but it was just over two days now, and she was slipping away. Meantime, investigators, numbering 125, scoured the Miami area and found an abandoned blue Volvo with Massachusetts plates. It was quickly determined to be the kidnapper's car when they found rope, masking tape, and a ski mask inside. Even more shocking, they found a key to the roadway inn where the abduction had occurred as well as the hand-scrawled kidnap sign just carelessly left in the car. Seriously, this is so weird. Given the detailed planning of the abduction itself, the getaway was absurdly sloppy. For also contained in the vehicle, as if all that weren't enough, were explicit photos of a man, completely nude with his face fully visible. He was also holding a strategically placed policeman's cap over his uh, private parts. The glove box was itself a treasure trove of documents, identifying the car's owner as George Deacon of Massachusetts. But those who knew and loved the Mackle family knew him as the boogeyman. So now they have a lead to follow. Investigators learned that a man named George Deacon was employed at the University of Miami School of Marine Science. They visit his boss, making visual note of the various tanks and beakers in the lab where this George Deacon worked. The boss tells agents that he hired Deacon six months earlier to pilot boats in marine expeditions. He could make or fix anything, the man explained, and it was his job to create ventilated tanks and boxes for transport of the specimens obtained during this marine research. Finally, he confirms that Deacon is always in the company of a postgraduate student named Ruth. She was later identified as Ruth Eisman Shear, age 26, from Honduras. Ha, huh, a Spanish-speaking country. They flash back to the ransom call and the voice with the accent. According to Deacon's superior, Ruth was tiny, with a slight build of a teenage boy, maybe? Leading investigators to wonder if she was the second kidnapper who had tied up Mrs. Mackle and had been posing as a man during the abduction. Eventually, the relentless detective work led to a trailer, purchased by a man from George Deacon the previous night. The buyer became very suspicious when he spied the front page news story about the Mackle kidnapping inside the trailer, so he called police. There were also numerous letters to George Deacon and a Gary Stephen Christ. A check on Christ revealed that he and Deacon were the same person. Christ, age 23, was a wanted fugitive from California. He had escaped prison in 1966 while serving time for auto theft. So now they knew who they were looking for, but had no idea where to find them. Nearly 15 hours after the second ransom drop, Christ called the agents to finally reveal Barbara's whereabouts. He claimed he had buried her near Berkeley Lake, Georgia, about 25 miles northeast of Atlanta. Over 100 agents covered the wooded area in a desperate quest to find Barbara alive. 
but the area was dense and spanned acres of wooded land. The situation looked bleak. And Deacon, Christ, whatever his name was, was still on the loose somewhere, so they would get no further help from him. Now, quick little aside. This made me wonder why they didn't think to use bloodhounds in the search. So I started snooping like a bloodhound, so to speak, to find out. My research revealed that while bloodhounds had been used to hunt Jack the Ripper in 1888 England, it wasn't until the 1970s that the United States got on board and began utilizing scent canines in law enforcement. So this being 1968, American tracking dogs weren't on the job just yet. Now, back to the search for Barbara. It was December 20th, and Barbara had been missing for three and a half days. Then, just when it seemed all hope was lost, an agent stumbled upon a pipe sticking out of the mud in the wooded area where Christ had sent them. With their bare hands, the search team pushed away dirt and thick mud, calling out to Barbara and listening for any signs of life. Finally, about two feet down, they uncovered the box and heard faint pounding below. They opened the crude crypt and discovered Barbara, dehydrated, weak, and 10 pounds lighter, but in otherwise good condition, inside the capsule. The resilient Barbara Mackle had survived. They carefully pulled her out of the hole, stunned that she had been buried alive for over three days, all the while affirming that she was now safe. But it was she who assured her rescuers that she was okay. Once she had recovered, she chronicled her miraculous story. She had been completely hysterical, panicked, and screaming when she was forced into the capsule. But when they gave her the kidnap sign to hold in the photo, she felt she had to smile. She didn't want her father to think they had hurt her, so this amazing, mature, 20-year-old forced a smile for her parents' sake. She later explained in her book, 83 Hours Till Dawn, I screamed and screamed. The sound of the dirt got farther and farther away. I couldn't hear anything from above. I screamed for a long time after that. So, how did she eventually stop screaming and survive? She had several tricks she used to calm herself and distract herself from her unthinkable situation. She recalled decorating the Christmas tree and the words she'd whisper as a child. Start at the bottom, then work toward the top. And she recalled a very macabre little girl game she and her friends would play every holiday season. You know how little girls are when they're around eight or nine years old. They host harmless seances, stare into the mirror, repeating Bloody Mary over and over. While well, Barbara and her friends would, as she put it, play dead, then chant a spell to make the, what, decedent, for lack of a better word, levitate. Now, I'm sure it never worked any better for them than it did for me and my friends when we had our mock levitations at our slumber parties, but it was a fun little trip down memory lane for me when I read about their game. During her traumatic ordeal, Barbara Mackle's faith that she would be rescued rarely wavered. She held on to the memories of family holidays past and looked with hope to Christmas 1968. Meantime, Ruth Eisman Shear has the distinction of being the first woman featured on an FBI Most Wanted poster. I have read conflicting information regarding her capture. Some say she was caught within 24 hours. Most news stories say she was on the run for two and a half months. Either way, eventually located in Norman, Oklahoma. She claimed she thought Chris had abandoned her once he had the ransom money. When the first drop was botched, they became separated, and she hightailed it out of there. She was ultimately convicted, sentenced, paroled, and deported to her native Honduras. Chris was on the run for two months before he was captured in South Florida. He explained that he had chosen the Mackle family from the social register and stalked Barbara for months. He told his parole officer that he was searching for, quote, a rich, tough-minded female someone who could stand up to the trauma of being buried alive, end quote. That was certainly Barbara Mackle. So what happened to her after she recovered from her ordeal? She married her close friend, Stuart Woodward, and they went on to have two children of their own. She never spoke publicly of the kidnapping until Richard Nixon, of all people, encouraged her to tell her incredible story in a book. With Pulitzer Prize winner Jean Miller, 
She co-wrote 83 Hours Till Dawn in 1971, and the book spawned a handful of TV movies and documentaries. Barbara and Stewart remained married for 43 happy years until his death in 2013. Now, do you want to hear something really crazy? Gary Christ became a doctor. He was a fugitive for two years, then he was sentenced to life in prison for the kidnapping, but he only served 10 years for that federal crime. He buried someone alive and is allowed to work as a physician in the United States. Upon his release, he attended medical school in both Grenada and Dominica, which incidentally is not the same as the Dominican Republic. I googled so you don't have to. He went on to earn a medical degree. His application for licensure in Alabama was rejected, but the Indiana Medical Licensing Board approved him in 2001. As of early 2006, he was working as a general practitioner in Crisney, Indiana, and refused to answer any questions about his past. He deems this intrusion ambush journalism. In March 2006, Christ was arrested again, this time for running an illegal cocaine operation valued at $1 million out of Barrow County, Georgia. He pled guilty in May of that same year and was convicted in January 2007. He served five years for that offense and was released. Yeah, he's out now. How nice for him. As for Barbara Jane Mackle Woodward, she is alive and well, living in South Florida at the time of this writing. I wish her all the best. She is truly an inspiring force of nature. So that's it for me today. If you enjoyed this story, please hit the like button, share with friends and family who may also enjoy it, and consider subscribing. I have lots of great stories planned all the way through Halloween. Finally, in conclusion, please let me know what your greatest fear or phobia is. After this story, I have to say, being buried alive has moved to the top of my list. Please drop me a line in the comments if you would. I would love to hear from you. Until then, have a great day and stay safe. Scary Clary out.